Well, sometimes I'm easily irritated. Do y'all believe that? It's, it's, it, it's really true. Uh, I just uh, hide it a lot. And it seemed to me that this morning's scripture actually uh, is complementary to my irritation or to, or to one of my current irritations, so maybe it will help soothe the beast in me, right? Uh, first off, I would, like to, I would like to read a quote from one of my favorite people ever, and uh, I'm reading it so I won't mess it up because it's so good, I think. Consider the words of Helen Keller. Security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. So, my irritation comes from, it's almost become ubiquitous. It's like of, of, I guess back in, I don't know when it was, in the 70s or 80s, every time you turned around, somebody was saying, have a nice day, right? And that's, and that's okay. I'm not, and don't get me wrong, I'm really not, I'm really not a total of, you know, curmudgeon, but of, uh, but there are some things that can, uh, can get to me. The current one is be safe, you know. For crying out loud, what, do I, what am I normally, reckless? Am I, uh, you know, am I, am, I, am I careless? Am I reckless or whatever, you know? I mean, whoever came up with this stupid locution, be safe, for crying out loud, you know? And moreover... Being safe really isn't a Christian value, and it's really not an American value. Of uh, if if you stop and think about it, you know, I for one am glad that of uh, Peter and the other ten disciples that were left after Jesus' resurrection didn't play it safe. I'm glad Paul didn't play it safe, you know. I'm glad John Wesley didn't play it safe. I'm glad Christopher Columbus didn't play it safe. I'm glad Martin Luther didn't play it safe. I'm glad Harriet Tubman didn't play it safe. I'm glad uh, Tony Rom uh, uh, Bishop Romero uh, didn't play it safe. I'm glad Mother Teresa didn't play it safe. You know, that's a safe thing to do, isn't it? Hang out in a leper ward? Sounds pretty safe to me. But uh, we have turned into a nation, sadly, in my mind, uh, that values safety or seems to value safety almost more than anything. And that's trouble with a capital T, as they used to say in the music man, right? Uh, so, how does that fit today's scripture? Well, let's find out. Today's scripture comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before God, our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope 
and our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about you what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Please be in prayer with me and for me. Gracious and loving God, God who calls us to be imitators of you and your Son to show goodness in this world, to speak the word with boldness. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, a little history, just a real little. It's, it's good to know. This is, the oldest, this is the oldest book in the New Testament. Paul's letter to the, the first letter to the Thessalonians was written about the year 50. I mean, we're, we're pretty sure of that. We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty sure. Some of the dates that we have are, are more shaky than others, but we're right around 50 is, is a good date for First Thessalonians. Paul wrote it actually not too long after he was in Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica is the name of the city where the Thessalonians live. So, uh, and Thessalonica is a city in northern Macedonia, Greece, northern part of Greece, and it was actually the capital of the Roman colony of Macedonia. So, at the time Paul went there, they were very, very Roman and very, very pagan, a lot like San Antonio, Texas in 2020, uh, if, if, if you get right down to it. You know, we're still, we're very Roman and we're very pagan for the most part, you know, in this society. Of uh, Anyway, when Paul was in Thessalonica, the people at the synagogue, you know, it was Paul's habit, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 17. We're not going to read that this morning, but that's where you read about Paul of establishing the church in Thessalonica. When Paul went to cities to establish churches, he first went to the synagogues because Paul knew that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and that Jesus came first to, to, to the Jewish people because they, should, they had already been blessed with the revelation from God and should have some idea as to what was going on. Well, Thessalonica is one of the places where the people of the synagogue didn't receive Paul very well. In fact, they, 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 they pretty much told him to leave, and um, some people that were associating with him uh, uh, one person in particular that's named in Acts chapter 17 is a man by the name of Jason. Well, some of the folks from the synagogue actually went over to his house, beat him up, drug him before a bunch of the town leaders, 
and started complaining about what Paul and, uh, and Silas at the time was with him uh, were doing there in uh, Thessalonica. And that's where, that's where we see the term, it's, it's right in that chapter where they talk about it. what they did was they turned the world upside down. That's what Paul did. He turned the world upside down, you know. Probably not a bad idea for most of us, but most of us, I don't think, have been turning the world upside down too much lately. But uh, anyway, that's another deal. So, Paul pretty much got ridden out of town on a rail, okay? So, again, back to my, my earlier point, there wasn't anything safe about Paul's ministry. In fact, I invite you to read about it. He talks about shipwrecks. He talks about other things that happened. He talks about the times he was beaten with a, with a whip, you know? Speaking of, you know, I started thinking about this. I started thinking, I said, Jim, I talk to myself a lot. Y'all know I'm crazy anyway, so it's okay. Uh, am I off track on this whole safety thing? And I don't think I am. I don't think I am. Bear with me. So I did a word search. I did a word search. The word safety, and sometimes in some translations it's translated as security, appears 19 times in the Bible. 17 of them are in the Old Testament. And uh, most of them have to do with stuff like fortified cities and, and things like that. And some of them say the Lord is, is my safety. You know, it's, it's uh, in uh, Proverbs 21, 31, I think it says that, uh, you know, you shouldn't trust in a war horse. Uh, safety resides in the Lord. That's where you get safety. That's where safety comes from, the Lord, the Lord. You can't, you can't make it yourself, just like Helen Keller uh, told us. It's mostly a superstition, of, you know. It's mostly a superstition. So, of uh, anyway, and in the New Testament, the New Testament, it appears twice. Once in Acts chapter 5, of, and you know what it's talking about? It's talking about how the... The jail was secure. Well, there you go. If you want to be safe, go to jail. Uh, which really is true, pretty much. It really pretty much is. You know, if you, if you want to have all your freedoms taken away and not have to worry about where your meals come from or where you're going to sleep or who's going to jump you as you're walking to your car, just go to jail. You'll be taken care of. Okay? And the other place is later on in 1 Th Thessalonians. It's later on in 1 Thessalonians, and it talks about how the perceived safety, or as Helen Keller would say, the superstition of safety, one of these days is just going to go poof when the Lord comes back. Okay? When the Lord comes back, you know, stand by as to what you're trusting for your safety. So, Paul writes this letter just a few weeks after he is run out of Thessalonica to the church that's there. And, and we don't really know, and it really doesn't matter, I guess. He was probably, he was either in Athens or Corinth of, of when he wrote the letter of and I was thinking about that, too. You know, there's not a letter to the Athenians. Did you all ever think about that? Yeah, just a just thought. But, but, but remember, the Athenians were the ones that Paul said, you know, you are very superstitious. And uh, they didn't receive his message too well. Anyway, what Paul was doing was he was doing a labor of love, which he alludes to later in the letter, to the, to the Thessalonians here, and we'll talk about in a minute, by writing them a letter. He was trying to encourage them. He was trying to encourage this new group of believers that had sprung up there. And most of them weren't Jewish folks that had converted. Most of the people in the church in Thessalonica were Greeks that converted. They came over and listened. And I've the first thing about this I want us to think about is 
again, we are a church. We are a faith of community. We do things together, you know, which is another sermon. How about these days, you know, of we don't do too much together anymore, uh, and I don't quite understand that either, but that, like I say, that's another sermon. Uh, Paul starts out, he says, Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy. He doesn't just say Paul. No, he has some people working with him, just like Jesus sent out his followers in twos, right? He, he, he sent out pairs so they could encourage each other and help each other in what they needed to do. This is not a me church. This is a we church, right? And Paul's telling us that there. And he says what? He says, I'm always thankful for y'all and what you do, as we should always be thankful in everything. And what? I pray for you. We're a faith of folks getting together. We're a faith of thankfulness. And we're a faith of prayer. By the way, just the word thanks appears in Scripture 71 times. And that's not including thanksgiving, grateful, and all the other permutations of it. Uh, uh, it's all over the place. After all, as Paul tells us later in 1 Thessalonians, it's God's will. It's God's will for us to be thankful. So what does Paul say? He says, you received the gospel. What happens when you receive the gospel? Well, Paul tells us here in his letter of encouragement to the Thessalonians, when one receives the gospel, they work in faith. They labor in love, and they are steadfast in hope. This is the first time we see the faith, love, and hope uh, triad that Paul uses several times. We're, most of us are probably most familiar with it out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter that ends, you know, the greatest of these is love. The deal. And most of you have probably also seen it up, on the, up high when you walk into the office, right? When you go in there, if you walk into Josie's desk and you look up, it says faith, hope, and love. So, the result of receiving the gospel is that you work in faith, you're steadfast in hope, and you labor in love. What's faith? I'll tell you what faith is, in my opinion. And you can check it out, and you can back it up, or you can look at other scriptures to see if it works. Faith is trusting in things you can't touch and you can't see, but you can verify them through experience and reason. Sometimes we use the term belief for faith, and that's not a bad substitute. That's not, that's not a bad tautology uh, as far as that goes, because belief is simply acting as if something were true. If you believe something, you act on it. If you don't believe it, you don't act on it. You know? So I've, 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 used the, I've used the illustration before, and it's a good illustration. I have great faith that when I flip this switch, some lights are going to go off. I also have great faith that when I push it again, they're going to come back on. Okay? Faith is not some nebulous of thing that just sometimes takes place. Faith is a thing that you can be absolutely certain of. It's rock solid, right? That's faith. It's not some, something that's just floating around out there. And then he says you're steadfast, and, and, and by the way, your works of faith, your works of faith. Faith without works, we learn in James, is dead. It says your steadfast hope. What is hope? A lot of people mix up hope with wishes. 
right? You know, if you find the magic lamp and you rub it and the genie pops out, the genie doesn't say, I'll grant you three hopes, right? The genie says, what are three wishes? And wishes are things that, you know, really probably do have very little chance of taking place. But hope is confident assurance in the goodness of God. That's what hope really is. And we should all have it, just like the people in Thessalonica had it. And then, of course, there are, and we should be steadfast in that. That means we should hope all the time. We should hope all the time. I, I, uh, Did y'all ever watch those uh, movies about, or read the books about Anne of Green Gables? You know, the lady up in uh, Prince Edward Island that wrote them. Oh, uh, anyway, I remember one of those in there of the folks that had adopted Anne Shirley of Marilla, or what's her name, uh, one day was talking to her, and Anne Shirley said she was in despair. And she said, you should never be in despair. That's denying God, all right? That's denying God. You need to be steadfast in your hope, in the confident assurance of the goodness of God and what's going to take place, you know? And by the way, faith has to do with goodness too. And then you should labor in love. Love is what? Willing the best for another person. That's it. It's that simple. Willing the best for another. That's what love really is. And again, love is carried out in action, in works of action. There's some other results of the gospel here that Paul lists that happened to the people in the, ch in the church at Thessalonica. It says they turned from false idols and turned to the living and true God, and they served Him. They served Him. But did you notice in there, it said they had some persecutions. See, when Paul left town, the rabble-rousers and the people that were beating people and going on, they were still doing it. Now, just another brief footnote here. It's interesting to me. There are several places in Paul's letters where he, he writes to other churches, and he tells them to be imitators of him. Not so the folks at Thessalonica. He was encouraging them because they were already imitating him. And what was he doing? He was imitating God, and he was imitating Jesus. Paul, who told us, you know, he was a good Benjamite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul knew Leviticus 19.2, which says what? Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. You see, Moses up there on the mountain, when God walked by Moses, Moses couldn't look at God, nor can any of us look at God directly. So God sent Jesus here. We can look at Jesus. We can look at Paul. We can look at each other. We can look at each other. And Jesus said too, in, in, in Matthew 5, 48, he said what? Be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. Paul said of the people at Thessalonica, wow. They're already imitating me. And he's not talking about, he's not talking about superficial habits or mannerisms or, or even some loose moral code. No, he's talking about working toward presenting God to the pagan people around him. Did you notice there, he used the term, turn from idols to the living and true God. Now I have to put in I have to put in my commercial for my never ending quest against stuff. But uh, this took tomorrow is bulky trash pickup in my neighborhood. You know? Now did y'all ever think about that? Do any of you consider stuff an idol? Just a thought, and hopefully it's not. 
for any of you, but just a thought. But why did Paul say the living and true God? Well, the people in Thessalonica were very, very much into, as I said earlier, the Roman culture and worshiping the gods of Rome. Well, who's the top god of Rome? The emperor, the emperor, which at this particular time happened to be Claudius. Claudius was emperor when this was written. The Romans considered the emperor the living God. Paul was saying, he might be living, and you might think of him as a God, but he's not the true God. There's only one true God, and you need to turn from idols and serve that true God. So, I challenge all of us to go out there as we leave here and as we conduct our lives to be courageous and to be adventuresome and to get out there and to speak the truth in love to those who so desperately need to hear it. But here's something I want you to do. We talked about the, the, we talked about the church being a group thing and not an individual thing. And I'm very concerned in our current situation, not just not with this congregation per se, but with, but to some extent to this congregation as well, of uh, to the whole world. And it seems to me, and maybe it's just maybe it's just me and 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 my of uh, my way of looking at things, but it seems to me there's less and less of us doing things in community. And reaching out to each other. I think that's one of the reasons I'll put in, you know, I think that's one of the reasons we've seen such a tremendous outpouring of people on the pumpkin patch this year, you know? I mean, I mean it's, it's unprecedented. It's record-setting, the number of people that have been here this year, and I think that's part of it. So, what I want you to do, here's your homework for this week, okay? Here's, here's, how, here's how you can put your faith in action. Here's how you can do a labor of love. Here's how you can be steadfast in your hope. Call somebody that you don't normally call, that you know. Just call them. Say, as John Prine would say, hello in there, right? Uh, call them. Let them know you're thinking about them. Let them know. Ask them what you can pray for for them. And don't just ask them what you can pray for. Pray for them while you're talking to them on the phone. Ask them what you can pray for and then pray for them. And then a corollary to that, if you're an overachiever, okay, if you're a type A-plus personality, okay, your, your, your secondary assignment is write somebody a letter. That's what Paul was doing. That was Paul's labor of love. He wrote these people a letter. And he didn't write this letter to us. We get to benefit from it, but Paul didn't write this letter to us. He wrote this letter to the church at Thessalonica. That's who he wrote the letter to. So, when you hear the gospel and the gospel transforms you, you work in faith. You're steadfast in your hope. You labor in love. You worship the true and living God and turn away from false idols and superstitions. And you serve that God. So the next time somebody says, be safe, say, trust God. <laughs>